Hello and welcome everyone. I want to thank you for your time uh, this evening or this morning or uh, this afternoon as it may be in your various regions. Uh, thank you for coming out uh, and listening to us talk. Um, as uh, as was just mentioned, we're going to be talking about specifically today's software defined radio. Uh, we're going to look at it from a lens of both penetration testing and analysis. So to be clear, um, this is kind of a primer level uh, webcast. We are not going to be able to go into uh, complete depth on software defined radio. Uh, software defined radio could easily be a two, four or, or six day course, depending on how deeply you wanted to go into it. Um, so the purpose of this um, of this webcast is going to be to give you kind of that introduction to software defined radio. We'll talk a little bit about when you might want to utilize this in a penetration test, when that would be appropriate. Uh, we'll talk about some of the software defined radio platforms that are available to you today. Um, some are, you know, from a kind of varying across the gamut from a price perspective, uh, some very affordable uh, and some uh, a little pricier. Uh, we'll talk about some of the pre-canned projects that are already out there that you can utilize uh, or it, as you start to get into research to go ahead and um, kind of use as a jumping off point uh, for your own work. And we'll talk about when software defined radio is not appropriate um, or potentially not appropriate. So just like any tool in our toolbox uh, as penetration testers or researchers, um, you're going to have the right time to use a particular tool and the wrong time. So what is software defined radio? Uh, software defined radio is basically, it's a radio without a purpose, right? So when you think about your uh, wireless access point uh, or your wireless card or your Bluetooth radio uh, in your cell phone or in your watch or wearable device or all these other kinds of radios that you're surrounded with every day, they have a predefined purpose. They work on a very small, uh, set or a singular uh, frequency, um, and they transmit and receive data in very specific ways. Um, a software-defined radio allows us to kind of go ahead and bust out of that paradigm and utilize uh, a hardware device that we can configure what it does, how it modulates and demodulates data, what frequencies it does that on via software hence the term software defined radio. Um, so there is going to be some level of, of programming and understanding of how RF technologies work uh, to do some of this. As I said, there are some predefined projects out there and we'll look at some of them uh, that you can just kind of start with right off the bat. Um, there are tools that will enable us to build these kind of blocks uh, and utilize them. So things like GNU Radio and GNU Radio Companion, uh, SDR Sharp for analysis. We'll talk about some of these other tools as we move along. So we talk about that Wi-Fi radio. We talk about that Bluetooth adapter, all these kind of things. Purpose-built, very specific purposes, but generally very straightforward and very easy to use. As you increase the complexity uh, of things like software-defined radio and you increase the capabilities, uh, you're also going to increase uh, the barrier to entry, the barrier to understanding, um, and the time involved, right? So it is it is very possible to play with and work with software-defined radio and spend a lot of time on it and not get a lot of interesting results. Um, but there are times where you will find a lot of very interesting things uh, that are useful to you. This is kind of a just a generic high-level block diagram of what a software-defined radio would look like. Um, you have some sort of antenna or antennas. Uh, you have a radio frequency front end, analog to digital converters, digital to analog converters, uh, an FPGA, generally speaking, some kind of field programmable gate array uh, for calculations, and some kind of controller that allows this device, this radio, to interface with a controlling device, generally some kind of PC uh, running some kind of software-defined radio, uh, receive and transmit uh, hardware, or software rather. So why software-defined radio? Why is this important to us? 
So we are starting to see an explosion of the use of RF technologies, right? You know, when we first um, when we first started doing this course in the early 2000s, we focused very heavily on Wi-Fi, right? Because that's what wireless meant for the most part uh, to most people at that time. Um, but since then, we've seen technologies like Bluetooth, uh, Zigbee, Z-Wave, uh, all these other kinds of technologies that are doing other things with the RF spectrum um, that are different and unique from wireless, uh, from traditional Wi-Fi. The software-defined radio helps us because it can look at all of those things, depending on the model and depending on the frequency ranges, but it can also uh, look at things that have maybe been around us for a long time uh, that we haven't necessarily done a lot of security analysis on that may be around us everywhere. Uh, so think about, for example, your car key fob, right? So if you have a car that utilizes some kind of keyless entry, uh, there's some kind of RF communication there that is sent when you push the button on the key on the key fob that tells the doors of the car lock, unlock, set off the panic alarm, uh, all these kind of possible actions depending on the button you push. Those are things that happen on the RF spectrum. And with a software defined radio that can access those frequencies that are being utilized by that key fob, you can now look at those transmissions, look at what they do, and potentially reverse engineer them, understand how they work. Um, and that could be anything from simple replay, if the if the uh, technology allows it, uh, to more complicated manipulation. So this is something that is, because of its rise, allowing us to not only evaluate newer, quote unquote, proprietary technologies that you may see vendors put out there, but also to kind of take a look back and look at some of the things that are around us and that have been around us for a long time, but we didn't necessarily have the tools to effectively evaluate them. Uh, one of the other things that we talk about in the Security 617 course is DACT, uh, Digital Enhanced Cordless Telephony. So those kind of cordless phones that you may see in your office or in your home, um, Previously, penetration testing on DECT uh, has required very specific, very old hardware, um, old PCMCIA cards running on um, older Linux kernels for, for software compatibility uh, to allow us to potentially evaluate the security of these kinds of devices. Software-defined radio is getting to the point um, where it's going to allow us to access the communications of those kinds of devices and potentially um, decode or eavesdrop on calls via cordless telephony. Uh, so these are just a couple of examples of technologies that have been around for a long time uh, where the barrier to entry and understanding has been either very old or very aged or just not there. Um, and so now there's opportunities for us to take a closer look at some of these things uh, with a fresh set of eyes and tools. So how can we use it on a penetration test? Software-defined radio is probably not going to be your first method of attack in a pen test, right? Um, when you think about your standard penetration testing steps, um, you know, your recon, your scanning, uh, your um, your exploitation uh, and maintaining access, pivoting through the network, all these kind of things. These are still things that you're going to do. Um, but if a if the scope of a penetration test has asked you to look at a specific type of device uh, or some kind of new technology or a quote unquote proprietary technology uh, that a vendor wants to deploy in an environment, um, these may be opportunities for you to kind of pull out the SDR and do a little bit more in-depth analysis. Most organizations or many organizations have some kind of proprietary wireless in play that they may not be able to fully understand. So we talked about DECT earlier, right? How often are cordless telephones used in a business? Um, and in a lot of businesses, in my personal experience, it's very frequent. So when the ability to eavesdrop on those calls has traditionally been limited to 10-year-old PCMCIA cards that you can't readily find anymore. Um, that's one thing. But if I can prove to my client in the course of a penetration test that I can eavesdrop on your calls, and let's say I'm in a call center environment where I'm taking 
credit card information over the phone uh, or some kind of personally identifiable information over the phone. Um, now the stakes have been kind of raised for that organization uh, via the use of software defined radio and kind of help them visualize and understand that exposure. The other thing you can do with uh, software defined radio is enhance the standard goals of a penetration test. So for example, one of the things that we might try to do in a penetration test is take um, you know, password hashes out of a Windows domain, uh, exfiltrate those, crack the hashes and try to reuse them to kind of work our way out through the rest of the network. Um, in Guardians, which is a penetration testing uh, focused firm in the United States, um, Larry Pesci, who's one of the co-authors of the 617 course, uh, and Galen Alderson published at DEF CON last year uh, a tool called Vapor Trail. And what Vapor Trail does is it allows for the exfiltration of data over FM. So, you know, that FM radio in your car that you listen to, um, you can send data over FM. Right, so you pick a frequency that uh, is not heavily in use in your area, uh, hook up a Raspberry Pi uh, in the environment, utilize it as a transmitter. Um, so utilizing a built-in tool called, R, not a built-in tool, but a, a Raspberry Pi focused tool called RPyTX, uh, you can go ahead and transmit uh, data out via that Raspberry Pi, and you can utilize a software defined radio on the other side to receive that data decode it, you could be sitting out in the parking lot or somewhere relatively nearby because it's a relatively low power transmitter. Um, and so with a low cost software defined radio receive only in conjunction with a Raspberry Pi, I can exfiltrate data out of a network for the cost of, you know, probably about 50 to 60 American dollars. The other advantage here is when we try to exfiltrate data in a penetration test over uh, the network or out via the internet, right? Or the traditional wired network, send it out over the internet, these kind of things. There are tools like data loss prevention tools, network monitoring tools uh, that are going to look for that and may potentially alert to these attempted exfiltrations. Do you know anyone in any environment that's looking at the FM frequencies in their offices to see if anything unusual other than like local radio stations is being transmitted? The odds are probably not. So this is a way to kind of enhance your penetration test utilizing software defined radio. Um, and incidentally, if any of you are kind of sitting there thinking about that and saying, wow, yeah, I don't look at FM in my own environment and I'm responsible for the security of a business. Um, there are some options here that you can utilize to kind of look at some spectrum over time using software defined radio. We'll talk about those a little bit later on. So when it comes to choosing a software defined radio platform, we have many options available to us. This is great because everybody's um, costs, availabilities are limited uh, and vary. Um, our needs vary. Maybe I don't need as full a frequency spectrum as is allowed for me by some software defined radios as others. Maybe I don't need full duplex transmission capability and receive capability. Half duplex is fine. Um, there's a there's a few things here, a few levers, knobs that allow us to choose different software defined radios. Um, and the answer is probably if you find yourself getting into software defined radio, you'll probably find yourself in a situation where you're going to have um, a lot of different kinds of software defined radio um, because there's certain things that all of them are good at. So if any of you are familiar with Pokemon, you know, you got to catch them all. Hopefully you don't get to full Pokemon with software defined radio. Um, but I personally have about four or five of them sitting here within arm's reach of me here in my office. Um, and if you find yourself getting into this a little bit more, uh, you probably will have quite a few as well. So one of the most well-known software defined radios today uh, is the Hack RF1. Uh, the Hack RF1 is capable of both transmission and receive uh, at half duplex. It was created by Michael Osman um, and it has a tremendous amount of open source support. It costs roughly 300 American dollars. 
Um, and it has one of the largest frequency ranges available in, in the commonly available software-defined radios. It can go from one megahertz to six gigahertz um, with 20 megahertz uh, channel width. So this is um, a very capable SDR. Uh, probably one of its only drawbacks is the half duplex capability. So if you were going to utilize a software-defined radio for the purpose of uh, simulating a cellular phone network, for example, you'd want full duplex for that. Um, that's not something this device could give you readily. Um, there are a couple of uh, derivatives and add-ons that have been built around the Hack RF1. Uh, one of the most well-known ones is the Portapack. So the Portapack is a combination of both hardware and firmware updates for the Hack RF1. So if you remember the block diagram we showed you a few slides ago, you had your software-defined radio and it was connected via some type of USB or Ethernet type interface uh, to some kind of controlling uh, device, some kind of PC running some kind of software-defined radio software. Uh, the port pack eliminates or lowers the need for that uh, add-on device and allows for the Hack RF1 to work uh, in more of a standalone uh, capability. Uh, so the port pack if anyone remembers the, uh, I, the Apple iPods from the early 2000s, the very, very original generation iPod that had that uh, big click wheel um, that wasn't all one piece, it was kind of broken up into multiple parts. You had the up, down, the left, the right, and the center buttons were all separate. Um, basically, what the port pack hardware looks like is it's a hat that sits on top of this unit pictured here. Um, and it has what looks almost identical to an old original iPod click wheel on it um, and a small uh, touchscreen display. And so what this will allow you to do is perform certain predefined software defined radio tasks and in combination of the touchscreen and utilizing that click wheel as input, um, you can go ahead and configure it to work um, in specific types of transmit and receive modes standalone uh, without any other device connected. So there's a great amount of community support here. This is probably uh, the most, in my opinion, the most well-supported community uh, for a software-defined radio device out there. Um, this is one of those devices that if you're going to be doing a decent amount of software-defined radio work, it's probably worth having this in your toolkit. Um, with or without the port pack firmware, I think is kind of dependent on what you want to do with it. Um, but it's a great frequency range uh, and the receive and transmit capability uh, definitely make this uh, a very good contender for having in your toolkit. The next one is the Blade RF. Uh, so Blade RF has been around for about five years now. Um, this will do transmit and receive, just like the uh, Hack RF1, but it will also support full duplex. Uh, so the cool part here is that you can do things uh, with straight out of the box support for this device for tools like OpenBTS and OpenLTE. Uh, so this means you can go ahead and set up a, uh, a cellular tower uh, for 3G or uh, LTE uh, via this device. Uh, to be clear, uh, I'm not necessarily suggesting that this is something that you do everywhere or for every usage. Um, every, um, every region has its own laws and legalities around these kind of things. So, you know, if you're doing it for the purposes of, of testing within your own company at, at low power, that may be one thing, but I would certainly uh, recommend exercising caution when transmitting signals, uh, especially within ranges, uh, frequencies where you may or may not have a license to transmit. Uh, so slightly lower frequency availability than the uh, Hack RF1, 300 megahertz, 3.8 gigahertz, uh, wider bandwidth uh, for channels, uh, 40 megahertz here. Um, it is a little more expensive, um, but it does have that additional uh, full duplex capability. The RTL SDR. So if um, if you have a software defined radio and you're just kind of getting in at the enthusiast level here, um, odds are you probably have one of these. And there are many different types of RTL SDRs. Uh, you see all you know all manner of form factors for them. Um, 
you see the one on top here, which is the, you know, kind of aluminum body uh, heat sinks uh, within it for, you know, thermal, good thermal management and dissipation um, to plastic housings and, you know, varying antennas and options. These started life as uh, digital tuners for cable boxes. Uh, so if anyone has ever had a cable service uh, in your region where you put a box next to your TV and you've got a coaxial cable, you know, connection at the wall uh, from your local cable company and you plug that cable into the box and you plug a, a run out from the box into the TV. Um, these um, the chip in these devices was originally identified uh, from one of those cable boxes. Uh, so they took it out, uh, reverse engineered it, built some drivers around it, and found out that it was um, they were utilizing a software-defined radio in there um, and basically building support around it um, via the box. Uh, so drivers were built for it. Uh, these were commoditized and then started to be sold. There are many varieties of these. Uh, you can go on Amazon or any other major retailer uh, and pick up one of these for anywhere from, you know, 20 to $35 American. The loadout's going to depend on the antennas that you have uh, that are packaged with it. Uh, sometimes you'll get one antenna, sometimes you'll get multiple antennas. Um, there are some variants on this as well from a frequency perspective. What you usually see is 24 megahertz to 1.7 gigahertz. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier about decked cordless telephony and the idea of utilizing a software-defined radio uh, to receive and decode that information. So one of the big shortcomings of the RTL-SDR is that it's receive only. So I can't transmit data with one of these units, which is one of the reasons why the price is so much lower uh, than the other options you've seen so far. But if I'm just looking to decode and listen to cordless telephone data, I only need receive capability. Um, but that's where the RTL-SDR, unfortunately, its standard frequency range kind of stops at 1.7 gigahertz and decked telephony works at, you know, right around 1.9 gigahertz. But there are some variants of RTL-SDR, um, like the E4000 chipset, uh, that will allow for tuning up more towards the 1.9 gigahertz range. Um, so there are some varying capabilities here. Uh, you do pay the price for some of those differences. Um, the one here on the top, uh, the unit, the aluminum unit, this is the one that we actually provide with the Security 617 uh, wireless penetration, uh, wireless security and ethical hacking course um, that I teach. Uh, and it's a great little unit to get started with. This is a very recent development. Uh, so, the picture. This picture is not incorrect, but you're looking at it and probably saying, that's not a software defined radio. And you'd be wrong. Uh, what this is, is it is a USB to VGA adapter, right? So, if anyone's ever uh, done a presentation, uh, in a meeting room, and the meeting room only had a projector that supported VGA, um, but you don't have VGA on your laptop anymore because you got your laptop within the past five years, uh, and so you have HDMI, and it doesn't support HDMI, and it maybe has DisplayPort, but the projector doesn't support DisplayPort, and the projector's, you know, 10, 15 years old, and it just has a VGA port on it. And so you may have one of these kind of rolling around in your bag. Um, some of these devices, uh, though generally the ones that support 1080p uh, have a chipset in them uh, or a chip called the FL2000 chip. This chip is actually a software-defined radio. So uh, a gentleman named Steve Markgraf uh, announced the availability of a tool called Osmo FL2K just last month uh, in April. Uh, and so what this is, is it's software that allows for you to repurpose this hardware, this adapter for driving, you know, video door projector uh, to transmit RF communications. So this is a transmit only device, um, whereas everything you've seen previously has been receive and transmit or just receive. This is transmit only. So basically what this does is it allows for the disabling of horizontal uh, and vertical syncing, 
um, if anybody remembers the old TVs where you had the horizontal and vertical adjustment, those signals get sent over these kind of adapters which would interrupt the RF communications. So uh, what these drivers do is they basically disable uh, the horizontal, uh, horizontal and vertical sync, which allows for a continuous transmission. So this is a relatively low sample rate. Um, it will only work with USB 3 uh, to VGA adapters. And if it is a um, 1080p or a 1200 p adapter, Oh, at this point, there's not a really good comprehensive list of adapters that work for this purpose, uh, but that is going to be coming, I'm sure, within the next um, weeks, if not, you know, months, if not weeks. Um, as I said, this is a relatively new development in the software-defined radio space. Um, these devices have been successfully tested to transmit uh, things like FM radio, um, LTE, GSM, and even GPS. And the craziest part of this, these generally run about five to $15. So someone has taken a piece of commodity hardware. It's kind of the flip side of the, uh, of the RTL SDR story, right? Someone has taken commodity hardware and reverse engineered it and repurposed it. And for five to $15, I can transmit GPS signals. That's a little disturbing. Um, and of course, the thing is, is where we've looked at some of these other options for $300, $400, $500, $600, uh, you could pair this with an RTL SDR and have receive and transmit capability. Uh, some other options, uh, the Edis, uh, SDRs, these were some of the first ones to market. Um, they are you know, some of the wealth, uh, most uh, well-researched and most well-maintained, highest build quality. Um, but if you've ever heard the phrase, you get what you pay for, um, these are pretty pricey. So if you're going to be doing a lot of software-defined radio work, um, going with the uh, one of the Edis options might be a good alternative for you. Uh, but if you're looking to do this at lower costs, um, this may not be your first choice. Uh, AirSpy is another receive-only software-defined radio like the RTL-SDR, um, but it, it tunes from frequency to frequency very quickly, which makes it uh, much faster than an RTL-SDR uh, to scan through a large frequency range. Uh, whether or not that's worth uh, the price uh, is going to be up to you. Lime SDR is a relatively new entry into the, um, into the software-defined radio space. Uh, so the full-size Lime SDR has been out for, I think it's about two years now, uh, for about $300, full duplex, receive and transmit, um, and goes to, uh, has a very decent frequency range. The Lime SDR Mini is just now beginning to become available uh, readily and offers 100 kilohertz to 3.8 gigahertz full duplex capability for $99. Um, this was originally crowdfunded uh, late last year uh, via crowd supply, and that has shipped very recently. In fact, my Lime SDR Mini actually just came in this past weekend. Um, so I haven't, haven't had a bunch of time to play with it yet, but this is a very promising platform from a spec perspective in conjunction with price point. So as it becomes more readily available, uh, this may be an option for you to look at as well. This is a quick kind of roll-up of the options that we've talked through um, in the past uh, few slides. Uh, so we've got some really neat receive and transmit capabilities for, for cheap with the RTL-SDR and the very new Osmo FL2K uh, software driving the USB 3 to VGA adapters. Um, beyond that, uh, you might want to look at the Hacker F1, uh, the Lime SDR, the Lime SDR Mini uh, for best balance of uh, price versus capability. So let's talk about visualization of data, right? So it's really one of the interesting things about wireless is that it's very esoteric to kind of wrap your head around because as you kind of look to your left and you look to your right, you know, there's wireless signals going through the air around you, going through you, um, but you can't see them. So 
as human beings, we're uh, we're driven to understand things that we can process with our five senses, right? Uh, so one of the easiest ways to understand and do research with software-defined radio is to visualize some of these signals that we can obtain. Um, so there's some various tools that allow us to do this. Uh, GQRX is a good option in the Linux and OSX space. Uh, so SDR Sharp for Windows. Um, and then you can do some uh, command line based options with RTL Power and Heatmap.py. Let's talk through all of those. Uh, GQRX, multi platform open source uh, software defined radio application for visualizing data. Uh, provided to you by a software-defined radio, uh, available in Linux via AppGet, uh, OSX via ports, uh, Windows. There is some support. I haven't extensively tested it. Um, I'd recommend sticking with Linux uh, for this particular tool. It has a real-time display of uh, a very limited frequency range, um, as well as a historic waterfall display. And we'll show you in the next slide some of, uh, um, you know, pictures worth a thousand words here. Um, there's support uh, for it to have plugins developed via the community. Additionally, it will do some very basic tasks via built-in tools. So if you want to demodulate AM or FM radio um, or some of the other very common protocols, uh, that support for that may be built in as well. It can record samples, um, and there's actually capability to control a software-defined radio over the network uh, or stream data over the network from a software-defined radio with GQRX also. So like I said, picture's worth a thousand words. Uh, here's an example of what the GQRX interface looks like. Uh, your mileage may vary slightly depending on what type of Linux you're looking at this in. The user interface may be somewhat different. Um, but up here at the top, you can see the 104.8 megahertz. So here we're looking at the FM radio range. Um, neat little trick, you can go ahead and, you know, get your cursor up here in your graphical interface and type in the numbers of the frequency that you want to tune to. Or you can utilize your mouse. And for example, here on the four in 104, if I click on the top half of the four, it will tune up one to 105. If I click on the bottom half of the four, it will tune down one uh, to 103 and keep all the other numbers the same. Um, fun little you know, tip to use. It took me a really long time to figure that out. Um, underneath, we have the fast Fourier transform graph. So this is kind of an overall you know, immediate view of what's going on in the spectrum. Uh, you can see over here near 105.081, kind of just to the right of center. Um, we've got a spike here indicating that there's some kind of transmission. And this has been running for a little while, so if you go down towards the bottom, you see this waterfall display, and you can see that we've been seeing a somewhat consistent signal uh, at that frequency for some time. If you go over here to the right, um, you can see some of the options available to you, uh, filtering types of modes. So this is the basic, hey, this is FM radio, um, and it will go ahead and demodulate it as FM transmissions. So if there was a radio station near you playing uh, and transmitting at 104.8 megahertz, um, running this with the appropriate software-defined radio attached to the device uh, would allow you to listen to the FM radio. So I know this seems like a long way to go and you've listened to me talk for over a half hour now to get to the same point of the radio in your car. Um, but this helps to illustrate that the, there's a little more work to be done with software defined radio to get some of the same results that you get in purpose built hardware. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, SDR Sharp. Um, is actually an application developed by uh, AirSpy. So these are the same folks that developed that AirSpy receive only radio, the, the very fast tuning one. Um, so this is now a closed source project. Uh, it is Windows based, uh, developed in C Sharp, hence the SDR Sharp. Um, just works as it and installs like a traditional Windows application. But from a user interface perspective, it does have that fast Fourier transform display, it has the historic waterfall display, and it supports plugins. So it's a good alternative, similar to GQRX from a capabilities perspective, but for the Windows platform. So here's what it looks like um, in a Windows interface. Uh, so you do see some of the similarities here. 
uh, your frequency up at the top, that's for your transform graph on the top half of the display, uh, waterfall at the bottom half of the display, plugins over here to the left. So RTL power and heatmap.py. So this is an interesting combination of utilities. Uh, so the RTL power uh, command is a command line application for software defined radio. Um, and what it will do is you provide it a frequency range and an interval, and it will record the levels of RF energy that it's seeing in that frequency range and output it to a CSV file, a comma separated value file, like what you would utilize in Excel, for example. Um, so what this is cool for is it allows you to scan greater parts of the spectrum than you can readily visualize in the tools like GQRX, like SDR Sharp, um, and then provide that analysis via a different methodology. This comes with the, um, the standard RTL SDR software um, package uh, that you can install via apt-get in Linux. Uh, so heatmap.py is basically a Python script that will take that CSV and convert it to a visualization, to a waterfall style visualization. Um, but again, the, the advantage here is that it's kind of hands off. You can do this and sample over long periods of time and help you kind of build a historical of what normal looks like for a specific frequency range in your area. So RTL power comes in the standard RTL SDR package. Uh, app get in, install RTL SDR will put uh, will install the RTL power command for you. Uh, specify your frequency range and your interval of how often you sample. Write it out to a comma separated value file, um, and then you can go ahead run heatmap.py, uh, provide that CSV value and a and an output file an image file for it to be written out to. And then from there you get a waterfall display. So Okay, you may look at this and say, well, this is great, but I saw this in GQRX. I saw it in um, SDR Sharp. But let's go back and look at those other options for a minute. If you look at this sample from GQRX, this waterfall display um, here is only showing us the frequency from 104.1 to 105.4. If I was looking at all of the FM radio spectrum, what is it, 88 to 108 uh, megahertz, this is only a very small portion of that. Whereas if I utilize RTL power and sample over the whole frequency range um, and then pair it with heatmap.py, what I'm seeing here in this photo, this is 88 to 108. So this is the entire FM spectrum for a period of almost 10 hours. So in a very compact way, um, I can visualize a much greater frequency range. Why is this important? Do you remember when we talked about utilizing tools like Vapor Trail to exfiltrate data over FM radio? So let's say, for example, I have entry into your environment. Um, I've, you know, plugged in a rubber ducky or something of that nature, and I've gotten a command prompt at a device. Um, I go ahead and I manage to run Responder, uh, capture password hashes for your environment. How do I get those out? Well, if I send them out over traditional email or traditional internet channels, your DLP may pick that up. So I utilize a tool like Vapor Trail, and I send it out over FM, and I pick it up in your parking lot, and I drive away with your password hashes. So this is a penetration testing scenario, right? But this could also theoretically be used by an attacker as well, which is, of course, the whole point of a penetration test is to simulate those kind of adversaries. But what if I could look at the FM spectrum and look at it over time for deviations? And the answer is you can with tools like this. Uh, so here you might be able to see uh, variations uh, or oddball behavior in the FM range uh, when you can view it over an extended period of time. So this would be one potential countermeasure uh, from a blue perspective to go ahead and look at some of these frequency ranges for potential exfiltration of data. So there's a lot of pre-canned, predefined projects out there. So we don't need to start our software-defined radio journey from scratch. Um, 
I think it was Picasso that said, you know, good artists create, great artists steal. Um, I'm not suggesting stealing from anybody without, you know, giving proper credit for their work. Um, but the point that you can take away from that is that, you know, if somebody else has already done great work and built a project that gets you 80% of the way to your objective, and they've published it under some kind of open source license, utilize it. Um, you know, acknowledge them for their work and build upon it. Contribute it back to their project. Um, you know, let's utilize these wonderful open source communities that we have now uh, and improve upon each other's work. So the cool thing about some of the projects that are already out there, they help us demonstrate risk, right? So if we're talking to our executives or we're trying to convey the value of a penetration test and the things that we've discovered and the risk associated with those, and we put it out to our executives and we don't have that kind of visual, we don't have that kind of aha moment for them, uh, it may not be as effective as we hope. And we may not be able to get uh, the remediation and the timelines and the, um, emphasis that we expect. Uh, so some of these tools are very helpful to us to kind of help identify and demonstrate that risk uh, to our leadership. Um, so let's look at some of the projects that are out there right now. ADSB. So ADSB is Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. These are beacons that are transmitted by commercial aircraft. Uh, so the interesting thing about these is based on their spec, they have to be unencrypted, and they're always transmitted at a specific frequency, 1090 megahertz. Um, so there's a number of things in that transmission, uh, the aircraft ID or tail number, current altitude, heading, speed, latitude, and longitude. So a lot of information about a specific plane. In the United States, these are going to be required on all aircraft by 2020. Uh, so realistically, what that means is that a lot of planes all over the world are going to be utilizing this. Uh, a built, uh, a purpose-built tool that's already out there called Dump 1090 will go ahead and take um, from a capture or from live data around you in the sky and will take that ADSB information and overlay it on a map and allow you to map aircraft uh, and their positions and headings in near real time. So you may say to yourself, I, you know, I've seen other tools that allow for this, right? I've seen this information on the internet. And in some cases, tools like Dump 1090 are underpinning uh, those utilities that you may see. But let's flip that on its head for a second. Let's put our, let's put our evil hat on and say, what can I do with that? Oop. Went one slide too far ahead. Um, so we talked about receiving this data. What about transmitting it? Right, so our planes out there are transmitting this information. ADSB can theoretically be used by aircraft for the purposes of avoidance and redirection of autopilot around obstacles. Uh, so back at DEF CON 20, Brad Haynes, Renderman, uh, was able to uh, show a proof of concept of transmitting ADSB, false ADSB information, um, and was able to uh, get a flight simulator on autopilot to actually respond uh, to that spoof data. So we were able to use a radio to simulate a rogue aircraft and get another simulated aircraft to respond in a potentially negative fashion. A little disturbing. Who here remembers pagers? Anyone ever carry a pager, you know, back in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s? Um, you may think of pagers as an old outmoded technology that we really don't see anymore. And in some industries, that's true. In the medical industry, it's very common to still see pagers. Um, why? Because they work. They work everywhere. They work in basements. They work in bathrooms. They work in all sorts of places that a traditional cell phone or other types of newer communications may not because they're very high powered, um, relatively low frequency. Uh, so this is broadcast traffic. It's not encrypted. Um, and the specific pager that the messages are intended for is identified by a cap code, a unique code for that pager. So you still see these a lot. And again, like I said, largely in the medical industry, but definitely in other places as well. Some IT folks you'll see carry these still. Transmitting information via software-defined radio for pager traffic is not going to be hugely effective in most cases because these software-defined radios lack the power 
uh, to get an effective signal out at a decent distance. There is some question about the legality of decoding pager messages that are not destined for a CAP code, uh, the unique pager code under your control. Um, check with your, your lawyers or your attorneys uh, in regards to what is appropriate in your region. In the United States, um, it's the understanding of the authors uh, of this course that decoding the traffic destined for your CAP code is illegal, but no one's ever been prosecuted for it. Um, however, there is precedent for prosecuting people who have decoded that traffic and shared it with a third party. Um, so that's specifically in the United States. Uh, so again, in your area, your region, your legalities may differ. Uh, but so transmitting here is not super effective because of the range and because of the power requirements. But what about listening? If I can intercept pager data, because again, it's broadcast traffic, it's unencrypted traffic, I can find a lot of sensitive data here. So we just talked about medical environments and saying medical uses this a lot, saying IT uses this a decent amount. Um, you may see pager messages that go out that transmit error messages, error codes, information about a specific server that's down, uh, information about a specific patient, right? You may see IP addresses, email addresses, personal health information. Um, it is not at all uncommon to see any or all of these types of data transmitted to pagers, which means they get transmitted over known frequencies, they get transmitted in an unencrypted fashion. So the command up here in the upper uh, right-hand side uh, is utilizing the RTLFM command uh, keyed to a specific frequency, piping that output to Multimon NG, which will then decode that traffic uh, via one of a couple of formats, POCSAG 512, POCSAG 1200, POCSAG 2400. These are various types of pager uh, protocols. And so it's running through all of them trying to you know, determine one that decodes uh, properly. So from a red team perspective, if you're looking for additional email addresses for a good phishing campaign, um, it might be helpful to utilize this and try and pick up on IT communications uh, or something of that nature. Obviously, if you're in a position uh, where you are doing a penetration test against a medical environment or something of that nature, definitely consult with your attorneys uh, in terms of what the responsibilities are that you may run into if you find yourself with health data. So, in the United States, um, we see or we've heard of, and the existence of these is uh, legend to us at this point, uh, the idea of the Stingray, which is a cellular tower utilized by law enforcement uh, to intercept uh, voice and data communications. Um, so the idea here is we basically man the middle of communications, access the data uh, as law enforcement. However, I'm going to speed up a little bit here to make sure that we have time to take a couple of questions here at the end. Um, the thing to bear in mind about this is that when we look at cellular towers, cellular towers don't, you know, pop up and go away overnight. Uh, so if I want to look for tools like this or other types of man in the middle cellular technologies, um, I have some options based off of the normal characteristics of cellular towers that we can utilize. Uh, so there's a tool called Calibrate, uh, which is utilized for basically identifying um, and recalibrating uh, those RTL-SDR, the receive-only units, uh, to determine if they're um, for frequency drift, uh, to help tune them appropriately. Um, how it does this is it utilizes known frequencies um, and compares them against, you know, what the RTL-SDR is seeing and seeing what the variance is. Uh, so one of the frequencies that it utilizes is cellular. Uh, so this is a relatively slow process using the calibrate command. Um, in this particular case, um, gentleman from InGuardians, again, Galen, we talked about him earlier, has utilized and the calibrate tool, uh, done some things to speed it up in terms of limiting the, you know, the floor and ceiling of the detection uh, from a power perspective and frequency perspective, and then going ahead and wrapping that and running it over time. So to look for, just like with FM, looking for things like exfiltration of data, here we're running this over time to develop a baseline and understanding. And so 
in this Ruby script in the second diagram, you see a scan where you see a, a cell tower on 231, a cell tower on 242. You see one drop off. Whoop, you see one drop off and you know the one on 242 is there then all of a sudden we see another one pop up on the next scan this could be indicative and at very high power this could be indicative of a stingray type device uh, being present in the area capture and replay attacks so if i've got transmit capability with a software defined radio it's possible to capture and replay signals well when we think about replay or like there's got to be some sort of protection against, you know, replay attacks, right? You know, replays, replay attacks have been known about in Wi-Fi for years, right? We dealt with this back in, you know, web. Unfortunately, um, replay protection has not always been built into um, the protocols that we would like to see it built into. So back in 2016, a um, gentleman named Caleb actually attacked his own Jeep. Uh, the Jeep was from 2006, so it is a little older. Um, but he was basically able to use his key fob, um, record the data, uh, capture the data of his key fob as it was being utilized, and then go ahead and replaying that data. And he was able to utilize that signal to lock and unlock his vehicle. So imagine if you're sitting in a car parking lot, right, and being able to pick up these signals from other people utilizing their cars. They lock their car, they unlock their car, they walk away, you come up, you replay that signal, you unlock their car. So that's a little disturbing, not just from the perspective of the risk perspective there, but how do you fix it? As a car manufacturer, what are you going to do here? You know, in the United States, we'll issue recalls for vehicles. Car manufacturers will issue recalls and tell people to come in and fix this item. But realistically, to do this, you're going to have to replace uh, the sensor, the, the receiver on the car side. You're going to have to re uh, replace the transmitter because you're going to have to do something different with how you transmit this data. Um, so they have to bring in their car, bring in their fobs, and not everybody's going to do this. So you'll never get to 100%. Uh, so this is one of those things where the lack of kind of over-the-air software update capability, which has its own risks, uh, presents a lot of complications in these scenarios. What if I have a completely unknown product? Um, so somebody brings me a device. We know it uses some kind of RF energy. We don't know anything about it. The vendor provided, they said it's proprietary, all these kind of things. Where do I start? So the first thing you should start with is look at what frequencies it utilizes. We have to know the frequencies uh, to know how to look at it and evaluate it, right? So in the United States, we have a um, we have a regulatory body called the Federal Communications Commission. Every um, every country has one of these. In the U.S., it's the FCC. In Canada, it's the IC. Um, you know, you have varying bodies. What is very common amongst them, um, and a lot of the bodies do model themselves after the FCC in a lot of cases, what is very common amongst them is uh, the requirement for a regulatory filing for a device that um, emits RF energy. Those filings have an enormous amount of information about the device. Um, sometimes you'll see full block and circuit diagrams, um, but invariably you'll see at least the frequency that the device works on. Uh, so then from there, we can go ahead and use an appropriate software-defined radio that can hit that frequency, tune it to that frequency, and exercise the device do things with it, push the buttons, you know, um, see what it does and see how it responds, and then look for patterns, right? So it's the same thing if you were analyzing um, an unknown type of cryptography. Is it really cryptography or is it, you know, ROT13 or, or some other kind of, you know, very easy to defeat algorithm? Um, the idea is, is that you, you do some observation and you look for patterns and then you go from there. You know, attempt things like Caleb did, replay the uh, traffic and see if you get the same kind of result or if there's some kind of rolling code or one-time authentication code or something attached to these that then gets refused. And then from there, it's going to be a lot of trial and error. And I say a lot of trial and error. Um, sometimes these devices are very poorly designed and sometimes they're very straightforward to reverse engineer and do unintended things with. Um, and sometimes they're well designed. It's just going to depend on the device that you're looking at. When not to use software-defined radio. 
Um, so software defined radio is a lot of fun. Um, I think you've seen some interesting things here, some, some neat things to play with uh, and to learn about, um, but they, it can be really time consuming. It's easy to lose a half a day, a day, uh, doing software defined radio stuff and just playing and just listening to signals and visualizing signals. Um, if it's a well-known protocol, uh, there are probably devices that are more appropriate for evaluation of that protocol. Uh, so think about something like Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is a relatively complicated, relatively computationally expensive protocol. Something like SDR, which offloads a lot of the modulation and demodulation to um, the controlling device like the PC, that's going to be something that's going to be pretty intensive. Um, Zigbee, for example, if you were testing that, uh, there's dedicated adapters out there for the purpose of testing it. Um, you probably don't need to reinvent that wheel. Uh, Bluetooth, especially Bluetooth Classic, is a very complex protocol stack. Uh, frequency hops at a very high speed, and uh, there's a lot of complexity there that it's probably not worth trying to emulate in software-defined radio, um, especially when there are tools now, like the Ubertooth one and so forth, that allow us to get kind of into that baseband layer um, with uh, without having to utilize SDR. So use the right tool for the right job. Um, when you don't have purpose-built radios uh, that allow you to do research, uh, when you have unknown signals or unknown devices, that's when SDR comes into play. When you need some kind of novel um, technology, like we talked about with Vapor Trail and other examples, uh, to kind of subvert some of those normal security controls uh, that are kind of stymieing us as penetration testers. Uh, so to wrap up, uh, SDR platform selection is pretty complex. There's a lot of things to choose from here. Um, visualization is going to be very helpful to you in some of these tools like GQRX, SDR Sharp, help you visualize the signal um, and understand where it's coming from. Long-term visualization is great for kind of evaluating things over time, which obviously is going to help us find anomalies in our own environments. Uh, from the blue side of the house. Uh, a lot of the existing projects that are out there can help you demonstrate risk uh, to leaders or to the people that can actually, uh, you know, help you affect change for, you know, risky things that you have in your environment. Um, but you can then take those and modify them as well, right? You know, utilize the, with, with in conjunction with the appropriate open source licenses, utilize that and go ahead and, uh, you know, continue to, to build off of these great projects uh, and contribute them back to the community when you're able to. Um, so that is uh, the end of our prepared stuff. I apologize, I left a very little time for, for Q&A, um, but with that, um, I'm kind of done with my piece. Uh, Ruby? Yes, hi, hi James. Um, there are just a few questions. Um, looks like someone's saying, it's from a while ago. Um, Lime SDR Mini should get a mention as it is $139 on $139 on a USB stick and gives you 10 MHZ to 4 GHZ. 10 megahertz to 4 gigahertz, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cell du duplex 30.7 MSPS, no matter what, if you catch someone exfilling via FM radio, it's the kid next door, not a serious connector. I don't know, more of a comment, I guess. <laughs> yep. It, it's um, definitely so. So, yeah, the Lime SDR Mini, we did talk about that a little bit. Um, I'm not aware of the Lime SDR Mini being generally available through retail channels yet. Uh, someone can feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on that one. Um, I've only now seen, I think, some of the last of the crowdsource ones getting fulfilled. Like I said, I just personally got mine about, um, uh, I think, this past weekend. Um, yeah, Xfil over FM, it is certainly esoteric, um, but that that perspective, right, is going to be what's going to permit somebody to utilize it and get away with it. So it, it's something to think about, right, as we continue to build our perimeters and we continue to build and harden our perimeters and, and our, our traditional egress points, uh, the determined attacker is going to look for other ways to get that data out. And yeah, some of you may be in environments where that, that's not something you really have to worry about. It's going to come down to your individual risk profile. Sorry, Ruby, go ahead. Okay, so the, um, another question we have here is, uh, what can we do to get a two, wait, oh yeah, what can we do to get a two-day class on SDR programming and scripting, specifically things like 
RFCAT and programming for Yardstick 1 and the like. Yep, so um, I'm, I'm not personally in charge of what courses get, you know, get made or don't get made, but um, Jason, hopefully you're listening to that, uh, to that feedback. Um, and then you can take that uh, as appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, then we have a random question for you. Do you mm -hmm. think the port, that's what they wrote. <laughs> Do you think the deport to VGA dongles will be done over the same way the USB 3-VGA dongles have been? That's a great question. Um, I honestly, because the research is so relatively new, I, it's hard to speculate on. I can tell you that from the look of the of of um, his research that we've looked at so far, uh, when it was presented last month, uh, when Steve presented that, it looks like it took him, and and there may have been more than one person working on it, but it looks like it was about two years um, from the time that he started working on this stuff. Um, until he had uh, a workable software product. So it, it's certainly possible, um, but I, I think some of it's gonna come down to uh, the chipset support. Obviously what he built uh, uh, or his team built works on a very specific chipset. Um, so maybe it's hard to say. Okay, um, and then do you see the use of LoRa Laura WAN being deployed more in the environment for sensor data and its long range and low power? Not personally yet, um, but I think as we, you know, dependent on the risk profile of the environment, uh, that's certainly an option that people should be looking at. Okay, um, I've seen the cheaper ones leaking RF like sieve, but capturing didn't look like meaningful data, so kind of concerning for the future. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you, you can and you can spend a lot of time on some of these devices um, and and look at it and and it may not be something very meaningful. Um, at that point, I'd say put it out to the community. If you've got trusted, you know, trusted friends in this community that uh, or it's a project that you can share that uh, share with other people, get multiple people looking at it, get multiple heads thinking about it. You know, multiple heads are always going to be better than one. Um, and another person may see a pattern that you don't, and, and I've, I've certainly had that personally happen to me, so. Okay, that was the last question, so um, I don't know if you have any other comments, James, or? Um, I wanna thank everybody for, for coming. Um, you know, I really, uh, I appreciate it for those of you in the States who are here pretty late, thank you. Um, I definitely, I can say that we intend to run this webcast again. It'll probably be my colleague Larry doing it uh, for North America. We're planning on doing that, I think, sometime next month. Um, but for those of you in the APAC region, um, you know, where where the time's a little more appropriate, definitely appreciate you all making time in the middle of your work day uh, to come to this. And, um, you know, for those of you who are looking for, uh, you know, some more fun wireless uh, good times this, uh, this summer, I will actually be teaching this class in uh, in Canberra at, at the end of June. Okay. Well, well, thank you so much, James, for your great presentation and for bringing this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, visit sans.org forward slash webcast. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact us at asiapacific at sans.org. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS APAC webcast. Thanks again, James. Good night, everyone. Have Thank a good day. you, Ruby. Thanks so much, everybody.